for joining us in the hour today's photo paint session. I hope that everyone can see my screen okay. Now today's session is going to be about working with various types of effects and also with lenses because I know that this is a question that comes up quite a lot. What is the difference between a lens and a special effect? So before we really get into working with lenses, I'm just going to very quickly create a lens here just to show you the principle of how a lens works. So I'm going up to Object, and I'm going to do something else before I start. Um, I'm a great believer in working with duplicates of original images. So the first thing I'm going to do is just to click on my background image and create a duplicate. And I'm just going to rename this to Working Image. Because now, whatever I do to this image, it doesn't really matter because if it doesn't turn out the way that I like it, I can always delete it here by clicking on the trash can icon. And I'm still left with my original image here. So now I'm going to create my first lens by going up to Object, Create, and going down to New Lens. Now we have a whole lot of lenses we can choose from in Photo Paint. And the first one I'm going to start with is called Replace Colors. Now, when you're working with lenses, a lens is going to appear as a separate object layer here in the object docker. So you could at this point, just to keep your object stacked nice and tidy, give your lens a, an own, its own custom name if you want. But for the moment, I'm just going to leave this at Replace Colors and click OK. So we now have a dialog box opening up, but you can already see that the Replace Color Lens is now at the top of my object stack. So in this window, we choose the color that we want to remove or replace. So I'm just going to grab my eyedropper tool and click on a color here. And you can see that this pink color has now been selected. And I can choose the color to replace it with. Let's choose yellow. Now I can adjust the color saturation here using the slider bar. I can adjust the lightness of the color, and I can actually go up and down through the hue scale, changing the colors to just make this a little less saturated. And I'm just going to leave it like this for now and click on OK. Now lenses are also known as adjustment layers, and they're specialized objects that let you preview effects and image adjustments without permanently altering the image pixels. An effect, so in contrast to this, we'll be looking at the effects later on in the session, do actually change the pixels in your image. Now, lenses can be applied to a whole image, as we've done here, or we can apply them to the editable area of a mask. And that's actually quite exciting because you can use various masking tools to create custom masks and apply a lens within that editable mask. And using the pick tool, as we'll see a little later on, you can actually move the mask and move the lens around your image. And lenses, the main advantage of working with lenses is that they're immediately adjustable. So if I look at this and I don't really like what I've done, I just need to click or double click on the lens here, and it immediately opens up the original dialog window. And finally, because the lens sits in the stack above the background image, if at some point I say I don't really want to work with this lens at all, all I need to do is just click on the trash can icon and remove the lens. If you're working with effects on the other hand, and you decide you don't really like the effect that you've created, then you have to keep undoing, undoing until you get back to the um, situation that you were when you started with. So I'm just going to close this image now and open up a new one. And let's just create a new lens again. So object, create, new lens. 
And a very useful lens, I find, is the grayscale lens. I'm just going to click on grayscale. And the beauty of the grayscale lens is it allows you, when you're working with a grayscale image, to adjust the contrast within that image. For example, if I tweak the blues, can you see how much more detail I'm getting um, in the mountain range at the back? So you can just tweak your colors in your grayscale image dialog box to get a really sharp, um, well-contrasted grayscale image. You're also able to add a tint here. So if I click on tint and choose a color, I can apply an instant tint to my image and also tweak the saturation here. Now, if applying this, this lens, I think, well, I don't really want to apply a grayscale lens. This small arrow at the top here allows you to drop down all of the available lenses. And I could go down here, for example, and choose scatter. And scatter actually scatters the pixels within the image and gives you an effect which is similar to pointillismus. So if I just go up here a little bit, you can get a nice blurred scattered image here. So it's very easy to just drop down the list, just changing the different lenses as you go. Now I'm going to open up, open up another image here and now we're going to apply a mask to our image. So I'm just going to close this one and open up my next image. And now we're going to apply a lens to a mask. Now over here we have our selection tools and we have various selection tools here. And I'm going to start off with a rectangular mask but I don't really want a sharp edged rectangle on the screen here. So I'm just popping up to the property bar and I'm just going to add some roundness to the corner of that rectangle. Let's try 20. And now when I draw my rectangle, you can see that I've got nice rounded corners. But I still have a hard edge to this selection. So what I want to do now is feather the selection so that when I apply my mask, I get a nice soft, transi soft transition from the mask to the rest of the image. So I'm going up to mask, down to mask outline, and I'm going to choose feather. And I'm going to choose a feather of about 40 pixels, and I'm going to apply this to the outside. Or I could leave it as average, it doesn't really matter. And when I click on OK, you'll see that the boundaries of the mask will extend outwards. So anything I do now to this image, and that includes applying a lens, is applied within the editable area of this mask. So I'm going back up to Object, down to Create, New Mask, and this time I'm going to apply a gradient map. Now what the gradient map does, first of all it's given you what appears to be a grayscaled image. And I have a range here from dark pixels to lighter pixels. But I can actually change the color here. Let me go through here. So I've got a nice brown here. And I can go through adding color markers. As you hover over the screen here, you'll actually see this hint docker open up. So I can double click to add a color marker. And now I'm going to add perhaps a lighter color. And you can just go through adding color markers as you see fit. Let's just see what this one looks like. Okay, I'm going to leave it like this. And the beauty now is that I have the pick tool selected. I can actually move this around my image. Now another thing, another tool that I, I quite like using for applying masks is actually, if I click over here, the brush mask and you're actually using a brush to paint a mask onto the image. So I'm just going to select this for the moment, and I'm going to switch from my mouse to my Wacom tablet because I find that quite handy. And I'm going to increase the size a little bit, so I'm back up to the property bar, increasing the size of my mask, perhaps a little bit more. 
Okay, and I'm going to go into additive mode, which means as I'm painting, I can add continuous, continuously to this mask. So I'm just going up here, going along here. and just painting in all the areas that I want to be masked. Like this. Now I can also go up to mask and turn on the mask overlay. And this will show me exactly if I've missed anything. So you can see here I missed some little bits here. Okay, so I've got more or less everything masked that I wanted to mask. But I'm just going to turn the overlay off again. So mask, turn off the mask overlay. And now I'm going to apply um, a, a, a new lens within this object. So new lens, and let's do a photo filter. Now by default the photo filter is always red, but you can choose any color that you like. And you can adjust the saturation. Okay, and again, with the pick tool, I can move this filter around, and I can even put filters on top of each other. So they're very, very um, adaptable. One other thing that's worth looking at is that because a lens is on its own separate layer, you can actually play, um, the, apply various merge modes to this layer. So I could see what happens, for example, if I choose a multiply mode, so it gets a little bit darker, or I could choose an overlay mode. So I can choose different modi um, to see what effects I'm getting. And again, very flexible. You can just move this around and move the lens wherever you need it. So I'm just going to close out of this now. And open up my next image, which is going to be this one. And all these photos were taken by a colleague of ours in the Corel office who went on holiday to Macedonia. So these are all images from Macedonia. Now, another great thing about working with lenses is that you can actually stack them. So again, before I do anything else, I'm just going to right-click and duplicate my image and rename this to Working Image. So now I'm going to apply a series of masks because it's interesting to see how the stacking order of a mask affects the final output. Because once you stack various lenses on top of each other, you can actually swap them around and you can use this little icon here, this eye icon, to make the layers visible or invisible. So let's add our first lens. Object, create, new lens. And I'm going down, I'm going to add a photo filter. And just so that I know wh which lens is which, I'm going to call this orange filter. And just click on OK. And again, instead of red, I'm going to choose something like orange. And just bring down the saturation a little bit. So my next lens is going to be pixelate because I actually sometimes I like taking an image and actually making it quite abstract and using an abstract image as the background for a poster for example that I'm going to put text on. So I'm going to go down here now and click on pixelate and I'm going to call this a radial, radial pixelate. and click on OK. Now you can see here by default the pixelate lens is just going to cover the whole of the image with square pixels. But I want to use a radial pixel, but I don't want the pixels to radiate from the center, so I'm going to choose a point of origin and place the point of origin here in the lower left corner. So now the pixels are radiating out from the corner. But I'm just going to choose a different value here, 6 and 2, okay. 
Now it's still very, very abstract, but this is one of the situations where I do actually go in and choose or play around with the different blending modes or merging modes. So I'm going to try difference. And that's very, very abstract, so let's try a different one. Let's try screen. Which is not bad because it's a bit abstract, but I'm still getting the, the original image coming through. Let's try one or two more. Overlay. That one I quite like, but I'm just going to try one more just to be sure. And let's try um, Exclusion. But I think I'm going to stick with Overlay. So, and the final lens I'm going to apply is going to be a gradient map again. And now it's turned it back to black and white. So now I'm just going to choose, choose some colors here. Some of these, I mean, I quite like playing around with all these different effects because you never quite know what's going to come out at the end of the day. So let's choose here a nice soft blue. And perhaps a little darker blue. Now this is looking a little bit strange at the moment, but once I start swapping and changing the layers around, you'll see that it makes quite a difference. Right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to try swapping these around just to see what effects I can generate here. So I'm just dragging the orange filter to the top, perhaps the gradient map to the bottom. So this effect I find quite interesting because I'm getting the the orange filter is at the top of the stack, so I'm getting this nice orange glow here. Beneath that I've got the, the pixel, uh, radiated pixels here. And at the very bottom I've got the gradient map showing through. Um, you can also at any time just turn off the visibility of, a, of an effect. And now I've just got a mixture of the orange and the gradient map lens. And that is basically working with lenses. Um, I'm sure you're going to have a lot of fun working with lenses. There are many to choose from. And again, you can mix and match them and get some astounding effects. So we're now going to go on to working with effects directly. So I'm just going to go to the right notes, right page on my notes here. Now there are many different ways of applying effects. I'm just going to close this image down and open up another one. And let's go over this one. Now, over in the toolbox, where normally you'll find the paintbrush, you also have an effects brush. So I'm just going to click on effects. You can also call this up with the keyboard shortcut V. But as soon as you've chosen the effects brush, up in the property bar, you've got a lot to choose from. So first of all, I can choose what category of effects brush I want to use. So I can drop down the list here, and we have smear, we have smudge, brightness, contrast, hue replacer, sponge, tint. Tint is very useful. We're looking at this. So various um, categories here. Once I've chosen a category, let's say I'm going to choose smear, within the category of smeary effect brushes, You've got lots of subcategories here. So for example, let's choose Raked Ruffin. And I'm just going to increase the size of this. And not only do you have a type of nib here, you can choose whether you want to, with a more rounded nib or a square nib. And you also have a nib shape. So you can choose one. I'm just going to scroll in here. And I really like the, the rough rake because it gives you almost an oil painted effect. 
don't know if you can see that here. As I'm going through here, I'm basically just smearing it, but it's giving a raked look, and it's almost like oil painting on the top of this. You've got the size here, and you've also got the amount of effect. So at the moment, I've got like an 18% 18, 18 intensity smear, but I can actually go into here, to just increase that a little bit, so it's not letting me, it always happens once in a workshop, guys, that one of my tools refuses to work, but believe me, you can just increase this normally. And again, we can just go in and smear this. Another smear brush that I really like is the Light Turing Cover. And again, I'm just going to increase the size. And this works a little bit, it's almost like airbrushing. So as I'm going through here, if I zoom in a little bit here, let's just zoom in. You can see almost this canvas-like effect, as if I'm painting on canvas with this. So let's zoom in a little bit more here. Now, if you think that using the effects tools is going to be something that you'll be doing on a regular basis, you might want actually to open up the effects toolbar. Now, if you go up to tools and you go down to customization, and under customization, you drop down to toolbars or command bars. You can see that actually, by default, not every toolbar available is showing. So what I'm going to open up now, I'm just going to open up the effects toolbar. Just say OK. And I can just move this over here, move it up to the top of my screen. And again, I've got my various tools here. And I can just select them as I want to. Let's just move out a little bit here. And what I'm going to do is, I'm just going to um, apply a lens to this. And I'm going to go down to my grayscale lens. Say OK. Now, what you can't do is, you can't paint with effects on top of a lens. So if I choose my smear brush here, you can see nothing's happening when I try to paint on the lens. Um, what you would need to do here is to basically um, select both layers and just combine these. And basically what we're doing is we're dropping all the layers so that we have one single background layer. So now I've dropped my lens, and my lens is now an integral part of my background. So what I can do now is I could, for example, go over and choose my tint brush. And the tint brush allows me to work with the color chosen to apply a tint. And I'm sure a lot of you remember um, those lovely old hand-tinted black and white photos. You can now go in here, and you can use the tint brush to go in and apply tint. And again, you can go up here, you can change uh, the size of the brush, you can change the brush nib. And I don't really see any point in changing this now. We can just choose one just to show you how that works. If you choose a different nib here, I'm getting a, a nib or a, a tinting effect that matches the nib that I've chosen. I'm just going to go back to my um, soft nib here. Um, another brush that's quite interesting to use is the Hue Replacer. Again, it's going to use the foreground colour. And what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to close this image and open back up uh, the original. Let's just go back and open the original. I'm just going ahead and zoom in a little bit here. And now I'm going to choose the um, Hue Replacer, and I'm just going to double click here on my foreground color, and just choose a different color, to choose a really dark red. And now, when I go in, it's just replacing, it's leaving the saturation, and it's leaving all the details here, but I'm just physically changing the color here, I'm replacing the current hue with the hue of my choice here. If you want to know more about any of these effects brushes and how they work, 
Um, at any time, you can just go up to the help file, go into the help topics, and just go to search, search for that brush, and you'll find more instructions on using that. So that is the Hue Replacer. Now, we've looked at working with the effects brush, but of course, um, if I go to the top of the screen here, I've actually got a complete effects menu. So as I go down to effects, I'm going to see the last effects that I used. I can repeat that. And I've got a whole set of effects here. Now, what I'd also like to mention, the, the webinar that we're now doing at this moment is also available um, on Coral.com. If you click on support and learning, you'll find this actually, this webinar that we're doing today as a written tutorial. And as part of the tutorial, you'll find lists of all the different effects that you can actually use. So one effect, let's just have a look at some of these effects here. Let's go to Creative, for example, and drop down to Stained Glass. Now we can't see much at the moment because the size is so huge, so I'm just going to drop the size down. And the solder width, I'm going to drop down to 1. I can change the solder color. So you can just go down, you can change the light intensity here. You can apply 3D lighting, which gives it a more embossed look. Now, as we've been working with all these effects, you can see that as far as the object, Docker is concerned. We can't see anything here. So all of the effects that we're applying are being applied directly to the image here. I didn't make a duplicate in this case. So it's being applied directly to my original image. Now another thing that's quite um, useful to use, let's go back to the other image to show you this because it works very well on this image. Um, if, you're, uh, if you're actually using CorelDRAW X6 and you're perhaps at version X6.3 um, and you have a, a premium membership, you might have noticed this new mask here, the planar mask. Now planar mask is often used for doing tilt shift effects because it's a mask that works selectively from a central area and fades out towards the edge. So if I click on planar mask, you can see I've got a centralized area and an outer boundary, so the effect will be applied here and fade out, fade out towards the edges. So I'm just going to move this down a little bit and just drag this out to the edge. And um, another effect that I like to use is going up to effects, down to texture, and in this case I'm using something called plaster wall. And as you can see here, I can use more or less detail here. I can do a randomization, but as I zoom in, I'm going from a structured effect back to the original image. And you can use this planar effect um, with any of the effects um, that we have up here, or with any of the lenses. So you can get an effect basically fading out back into the original image. And, I mean, we could spend all day going through all of these effects here. I think we've covered most of the things I wanted to cover today. If you want to get rid of um, um, the mask, go up to mask, click on remove, click back on your pick tool, and then you can see the final effect here. So it's going from this plasterboard effect, and it's fading into the original image. And there are so many effects here that you can play with. So you can... Um, apply effects to an image. On top of that, you could layer a lens. You can use various selection tools um, to help you apply your lenses and just move the lens with the effect around your image until you get, until you get the look that you're actually aiming for. So, Cecile, I think we're open for questions now, if anyone has any questions. Hello, Cecile.
I think yes, so, lost sorry, our Suzanne. Hang on, the I'm there. I was um, Suzanne. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was on yes, mute. I'm here. Yeah, I was on mute, so thank you. So uh, if you can uh, perhaps um, take five more minutes, I'm waiting for the question. I just send uh, um, the note to everybody that they can start asking uh, you the, the question. So if you have like okay. uh, any additional tools to show us during the next five minutes? Um, well, let's just I mean, continue looking at some of the effects that we have here. Let's just undo this. And you can see now that in order to remove an effect, I have to really undo it, go all the way back. Um, to the original image. So I'm just going to duplicate this while we're waiting. Just rename this working image. And um, although I've been working with Draw and Photo Paint for many years, um, hopefully I'll be able to answer most of your questions. If there's anything I don't know, because all of these programs are like icebergs, you become familiar with the top part that's peeking out of the water, but there's always a lot that you've perhaps not used before. Um, if I can't answer your question immediately today, then please send us your email address and I'll send you an answer tomorrow. So what other effects do we have here? Um, we have camera effects, and again we have a colorize effect, but another effect which is really fantastic is the time machine. Now with the time machine, we're trying to reproduce historical photographic um, processes. So here, for example, is an example of the daguerreotype, which was actually the first type of photo ever produced. And it was widely used from 1939 to 1855. And you've got a little bit about the history here. Images were captured directly onto a thin piece of silver-plated copper. And because no negative were produced, copies could not be made. Um, now, when you're trying to reproduce this historic process using the time machine effect, you can actually use this with or without the original photo edge. So the daguerreotypes were normally in a nice wooden um, gilded frame, but you can actually take this frame off. And we've also got here, we've got sepia or albumin, which gave the sepia effect. An albumin was used from 1855 to 1890s using egg whites. And we're moving along the timeline here to the cyanotype, 1841. Early platinum print. Early color, which I love. It gives this lovely soft muted color effect. Box camera. And finally, cross process. It's really sort of modern, very punchy colors. So if you're aiming, I mean, it, and today, people are trying to reproduce these retro looks using Instagram, for example. But here, you can actually reproduce some of these old photographic effects. So I'm just going to cancel out of that. So see, just give me a shout if you have any questions come in. But I'll just keep going until we um, have anything else. Yeah. Well, um, I have two questions, but finish what uh, what you are demoing, and uh, I will ask um, you a question. Otherwise, I was just going to go through the effects, just looking at different effects that we have here. Uh, we also have 3D effects. So if I go down, for example, to um, Sphere, I can create um, a sort of a fisheye effect, which I'm not really seeing at the moment. Let's do preview. This was working a little earlier on, but it's not working at the moment. Okay, let's just try placing a center here for the fisheye effect. Ah, oh, because I'm on the background, I'm on the wrong layer. Very important, guys, if you're working with a duplicate image, make sure you're working on the right layer. Let's just try this again. Sphere. Just move this up. So now you can see you're getting the fisheye effect. Okay, Cecile, should we take the first question? Yes, for sure. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> one of the question is, uh, which 64-bit uh, version of Windows do you find the most trouble-free when working with PhotoPen X6? Oh, um, <laughs> well, to be honest, I'm actually, at this moment, at this moment, I am working on PhotoPaint X6 on Windows 8 64-bit. It is very fast, but sometimes a little bit unexpected. Um, I loved, loved Windows 7 64-bit. Um, 
but perhaps it's early days, perhaps there's going to be service packs coming out for, for Windows 8. Um, I generally don't have many problems. Um, as you can see, I've been working today on Windows 8 64 bit and we haven't had any issues so far. Um, I think it's just a matter of preference that it is, Windows 8 is very fast. But I think in terms of stability, I would probably say for me personally, I find Windows 7, 7 a little bit more, more stable. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, another question is, um, somebody missed the five uh, first minutes, so maybe if you can go uh, a little back to what you have just started with. Okay, okay, we'll do, the, we'll do this again, okay. Right, so, um, might as well stay with this, um, with this image. Now, let me think here, I've got my notes of everything I wanted to say, so I don't forget what I'm saying here. Right. Now, the main, the main purpose of this session today was um, to show everyone how to use effects, brushes, and how to use lenses. And I know from personal experience when I'm at trade shows and things like this, that people come up saying, well, what is a lens, and, 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 and how does it differ from, a, from an effect? Now, um, because you saw the last bit of, of, of this tutorial, you've seen that effects are applied directly to the pixels of the image. So nothing changes when you look in the object docker. Um, although we're applying effects, nothing changes here. But when you're applying a lens, if I go back up to object and I create a new lens, I've got various lenses to choose from to start off with. Let's choose, for example, first of all, just a photo filter. Can give this a name. Let's just call this uh, pink, something like that. And a filter has its own dialog box here, and I can just go drop down here and just apply a, fil a filter here, change the saturation. But the most important thing here, before I've even said OK to this, in our object dock at the top of the stack, we now have a separate lens layer or lens object. And the beauty of this is that I can stack lenses, I can stack lenses on top of each other. So let's go back into here, choose another lens, and let's go back to the pixelate because the you can see these um, you can see the effect quite strongly here with the pixelate lens. Again, let's choose radial. Let's apply this radial lens um, over here somewhere. Let's change a couple of things here. Okay. So I've now got these lenses stacked on top of each other. Now these um, lenses are also called adjustment layers because as long as I save my document as a CPT, a Coral Photo Paint file, I'll always have access to these layers. If you save this image now um, as a JPEG or a PNG or a GIF or a TIFF, it's going to flatten it down to one layer, similar to what we had earlier when I combined the grayscale lens with the background layer. So it's going to combine them, and you're just going to have a flat layer. So if you open that JPEG up, you're not going to see any lenses that you can edit anymore. But if you save the image as a, CP, a CPT file, you can go in at any time, double-click on the lens, just go in here, um, change the color, OK. And I can actually... Um, change any of these lenses, I can go back and select this top lens and I can also affect how this lens um, behaves with the layer beneath. So let's just choose that now. So we're not seeing much of the pixelate now, we've lost a lot of it and we're seeing this one. I can just drag this up to the top and I can just go around applying different effects here until I get the effect that I like. So I've now got a much punchier image here. So I've just chosen multiply and I've got a lot more contrast in here. And the beauty also of lenses is, which you can't really do with an effect, if I don't like a lens, I can just go down here and click on that. Whereas if I've um, applied um, effects to an image, either using the effects brush or using one of these effects, I have to keep undoing it. Or, or I can also delete the working image layer, I can just delete that whole layer. So that is basically um, 
the difference between a lens and an effect. So do we have any more, any more questions, Cecile? Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you for uh, covering the, your first five minutes webinar. <coughs> Question. There is a filter in Photoshop called Diffuse Glow, which highlights whites without a soft glow. Is there any similar tool in Corel Photopand? Oh, that's a good one. I don't, I don't know. Let's, let's, just, let's just go through the, the lenses. Um, sorry, uh, what, is this lens, what is this filter called in Photoshop exactly? Diffuse Glow. Diffuse Glow, okay. Um, if I can't find anything similar now, um, Cecile, if you'd like to send me the customer's email address, yep. I'll have a little look because I do actually have um, a Photoshop installed on another machine and I can go and try it out there and then try try to um, reproduce something similar in PhotoPaint. Right, Diffuse Glow. So is this giving a sort of um, like a neon edge to things? I'm not sure. Uh, Rupert says that it highlights whites with a very soft glow. Okay. I'm looking down on here. I can't see anything here that would reproduce that. But if it's okay with you, Robert, I'll have a little play um, with Photoshop tomorrow or Monday latest because I have another training session tomorrow. And I'll get back to you uh, on Monday with that if that's okay. Yeah, so I'm currently asking um, his email, <clears throat> and we'll go back to you, Rupert, with uh, additional feedback. <clears throat> Another question, is there any advantage um, to use an effect directly on an image versus a lens effect? Could, you, could we use uh, lenses exclusively, as an example? You can, you can use lenses. The thing about lenses is lenses, if you look at the, the lenses here, we've got things like brightness, contrast, intensity, a lot of these lenses um, have a lot to do with image adjustment. So you've got channel mix, you've got color balance. A lot of the effects are more artistic. So if you just look at these, we've got grayscale, hue saturation lightness, we've got um, despeckles, we've got photo filters, um, noise removal. So these are all, a lot of these lenses are things that you would find normally um, often under adjustment tools or um, specialized brushes. And if you compare that with the effects here, you've got lots of special effects like 3D effects or art strokes. I could turn this into an impressionist painting, for example. So effects tend to be more artistic and the lenses tend to be more um, subtle adjustments. We just um, we just choose a different effect. If I go back up to here, and again we can go and choose just a different one here. Contour, creative. What else have we got here? Um, fabric. We've got different fabrics in here. So these are all more um, more special effects. Do we have another question, Cecilia? Yes, Suzanne. Um, before going um, to um, the other questions, uh, we have a big thanks um, from different uh, participants. So it's really great to have all your very positive feedback. So great webinar as Thank usual. Thank you so much, guys. I'm glad, I'm glad yeah. you're enjoying it. Uh, thanks, I lady. I wish I could have you all in the room here so that we oh, could all yeah. work together. That would be ideal. Yeah. Um, very, yeah, we have like very nice comments. So I will send you all the comments, the positive comments, Suzanne, after the webinar. So another Thank question you. from Jason. What is the easiest way to take out unwanted areas in the photo? Uh, that means removing people on the wall of the image. Ah, frame. okay. Right, just let me close this one down. I'm just going to open up another image, Jason. Let's go to the... No, where am I? Where did I put this? Where did I put this? Demos. Um, so I'm just going to grow... Um, spare me for a second. Because I was at a trade show last week and I was asked exactly that question. Um, I'm just going to um, go out of... Or drop down out of photo paint for the moment and just open up cold draw over here. I, 
think Jason, you're going to love this. So, let's just open other. I am well organized, guys. I've just got so much stuff on this machine that I have to navigate through to find it. There we go. So I'm just going to go into slideshow mode and just jump through that till I find the page I'm looking for. There we go. I'm back. So I've got an image here and I'm I'm in the coral draw. And the reason I've gone into coral draw is, is that I've got this image in this coral draw document but I can't for the life of me remember where I saved the original image. So we're going to open it up from within CorelDRAW. So I'm just going to click on um, Edit Bitmap, which is going to take us back into Photo Paint. And we've got a fantastic new feature in here under Image, and it's called Smart Carver. Now the Smart Carver can do three things. Now just imagine we've got an image here, and it's got these four kids in the middle and it's got a lot of detail here. Now if you need an image of a specific size, uh, the normal thing to do would be to crop it, okay, crop it to a specific size, but perhaps there's something over here on this side that you don't want to lose, okay. So one of the things you can do with smart carving is to contract the image horizontally and as I'm contracting it, can you see the kids aren't changing shape but the background is contracting. Let's just go back out again, right? And you can do this horizontally or vertically. If you know how many pixels you want to work with, you can actually uh, put a precise pixel amount in here. But the thing which is actually, um, sorry, fantastic is the ability to remove people from, um, from images. So I'm going to go down here and click on my removal brush, which is red. I'm just going to increase the size of this. Let's increase this to about, so about 80. And now, all you need to do now is paint out whatever it is you want to remove. So just going around this. So we want to remove this lead. Now, if something's in very close proximity, and you want to make sure it doesn't get altered, you've actually got a sort of a protection brush here, which is green. And anything you don't want to um, lose, you can just protect. And when you're ready, you just click on the Auto Contract Horizontally to remove red painted areas. So just going to do its thing. Let's just hide the mask. Now you're probably thinking, right, there's a big, there's a big old seam going down the middle here but down the bottom we've got background fusion. And if I just click on OK, that's my final result. OK, so Smart Carver is probably your best tool for removing unwanted girlfriends, ex-mother-in-laws and anything like that you need to get out of your photos. That's the Smart Carver. So any more questions, Cecile? <laughs> no, um, I think we are about it. So thank you so much, Suzanne. Um, it's it's really great. Um, very positive feedback. Um, Jason says uh, fantastic. Uh, so very good uh, uh, answers, uh, Suzanne. So uh, uh, we should. Uh, it seems that there is um, some people asking for more webinars in Coral Photo Pan. So oh, I guess no. that. Uh, oh no! Not more webinars. <laughs> <laughs> We love doing webinars. Um, please give us some feedback on what sort of things you'd like to have in your webinars because basically we just, you know, invent these. We think, what could we do today? But of course we want the webinars to be for you. So if there's things that you think, right, I just can't get my head around this or I can't find enough information in the help file, just, just give us your feedback and let us know and we'll put the webinars together just, uh, just tailor-made for you. Okay? Yeah, okay. Um, 
So let me answer your guitar. So the tool um, you've just used, um, it's called Smart Carver, correct? Yes, an image. Yeah, and it's image. a new tool in X6. Yes, Smart Carver. Hmm. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you very much. So, um, yeah, if, if you have any feedback about the things you would like to um, to see in our upcoming webinars, uh, we have already webinars until uh, October with uh, different subjects. So, I invite you um, to check on coral.com slash coraldraw dash webinars uh, all the upcoming um, subjects. They are very interesting ones also. Um, so, thank you again very, very much, um, Suzanne, for your time time today uh, for all your techniques. Um, just re would like to remind uh, all the participants that Susan will be on our Facebook, Radio Facebook page on May 16th at 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern uh, time. And she can answer so some additional question uh, you may have on Coral Photo Paint or Quadro Graphic Suite. So don't lose uh, this opportunity to ask additional que uh, question to our um, key quadro specialist and trainer. Also, um, if you need any further information on Coral Graphic Suite X6, you can visit coral.com slash Coral Draw. Um, next month, um, we'll have another webinar, another free webinar. It will take place on Thursday, the June the 13th. Uh, it's funny, Suzanne, because I think it's your son's birthday and it's my husband husband's birthday that day. Ah. <laughs> So Thursday, June the 13th at uh, from 2 to 1 p.m., uh, which is 5 to 6 p.m. London time. Uh, we have our other quadro specialist and trainer, uh, Roger Weinbolt. Uh, he has written the book, Bring It Home with Quadro, and he will provide you an overview to customize your Quadro workspace uh, in order to increase productivity, another very interesting subject. So to Is register... Mm -hmm. And I want to say, don't miss Roger's um, webinars, because Roger is actually the guy that taught me everything I know. He's my guru, so oh, wow. go and watch Ro Roger's webinars. I can really recommend them. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Suzanne. So to register, just simply go to coral.com slash coraldraw dash webinars. Um, I hope you have, um, you really enjoyed this, uh, this webinar, I'm sure. I uh, would like to wish you um, all the best for the rest of the day. Um, thank you very much for your participation and talk to you next month. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.